Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to Data.Europa Academy webinar, uh, Stories from the Use Case Observatory, Volume 1. This is the first of a series of three webinars dedicated to our research uh, project, uh, the Use Case Observatory, and its three publications. Uh, my name is Julia Carsaniga, and uh, I will facilitate today um, the session on behalf of data.europa.eu, the official portal for European Open Data, which is managed by the Publications Office of the European Union. Before going to our agenda, um, I would like to remind you of some rules of the game. Um, so first of all, as you can see, this um, webinar is recorded. So we will make available the recording to you um, following this webinar, probably next week, and we will make sure also to inform you via email. A second and third important aspect uh, um, is please, if you can, switch off your camera and your microphone uh, during the webinar um, to allow the speakers to smoothly present and not be interrupted. Um, but of course, if you have any question or comments um, throughout the session, please feel free to use the chat. Uh, we will try to respond to the questions directly in the chat when possible, and otherwise uh, we will make sure to answer as many questions as possible during, during our Q&A later. So I can already hear someone um, with a microphone on. Um, yeah, please um, maybe <laughs> switch it off or we'll try to mute you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yes, so this is our agenda for today. Um, as you can see from point one and two, the first part of our webinar will be about introducing the research, research project, uh, the Use Case Observatory, and um, its first report. I will therefore walk you through the what, the why, and the how of our research project and share some insights uh, of our first analysis. In the second part, I will give the floor to our speakers, Guglielmo, Clara, Jelle and Stefan, who I will introduce better later and who will represent four of our 30 reuse cases participating in uh, the Use Case Observatory Research Project. Finally, we will have some time for Q&A and feedback. So what is the Use Case Observatory? The Use Case Observatory is a data.europa.eu research project that monitors uh, the impact and developments of 30 reuse cases um, over the years from 2022 to 2025. By doing so, the observatory wants to contribute to uh, the portal's broader goal of measuring impact of open data. And in particular, it wants to do so by answering uh, the following three questions. What is the impact created by the 30 reuse cases analyzed from an economic, governmental, environmental and social perspective? How important is to keep track of such reuse cases to better understand uh, impact creation and to foster value creation through open data in Europe? And finally, what else can be learned from these analysis and from these reuse cases to improve open data measurement and implementation across Europe? In relation to this latter question, we can see that we can see how um, by analyzing the achievements and the developments of these 30 reuse cases over a longer period of time, the observatory should provide useful insights into the entire impact trajectory of uh, open data reuse, from the collection and process of public data to the delivery of the reuse case to the benefit of our economy, of our government, society and environment. Um, this should therefore, on the one hand, um, support reusers to increase and better track the impact they have, but they should, this should also provide um, useful insights for us to go forward in the European debate on open data impact assessment. In fact, uh, together with other exercises, such as for, in, um, such as for instance, uh, the literature review, uh, that we will publish uh, also soon. Um, the Use Case Observatory um, is um, wants to contribute to uh, construct a standard methodology of impact assessment of open data across Europe. So this is our why launching the Use Case Observatory. 
um, talking about methodology, um, I would like to give you also an overview of how we um, proceeded in uh, this research project. So the first step uh, was for us to create an inventory of open data reuse cases, which was based on three main sources. Um, the open data maturity, which is this annual um, report analysis of data.europa.eu um, about the maturity level of European countries uh, with respect to open data implementation. Uh, the EU Dataton, so the annual open data competition organized by uh, the publications office and uh, the data.europa.eu repository of reuse cases already organized according to specific categories. Drawing from this inventory, uh, we were able to um, identify more than 600 reuse cases. And uh, from this pool, we tried to use specific criteria to uh, shortlist our reuse cases. Main criteria were uh, the type of reuse case. So we tried to focus especially on mobile applications, websites, and online platforms. Geography, so we considered um, only European reuse cases and we try to strike a balance um, um, among European member states and to include as well EFTA countries and neighboring countries. Another criteria was impact. We try to have a good mix of reuse cases uh, with an economic, governmental, social and environmental impact. Uh, which uh, meant, for example, in the case of the social impact to encompass reuse cases um, in the area of healthcare and, and well-being um, or reuse cases uh, fight again against inequality in the society. Further criteria uh, that we use were also considering whether reuse cases were um, recently won an award or participated in competitions such as the EU Dataton, whether these reuse cases focused on uh, women, uh, not in employment, not in education, people or any other marginalized groups in the society. And finally, we also consider whether reuse cases were responding to crucial challenges of our time in line with the European Commission's priorities until 2024, such as, for instance, the European Green Deal. This methodological approach uh, allowed us to shortlist um, more than 100 reuse cases, which were then contacted via email or social media. And out of these 100, we were uh, able then to um, have our 30 reuse cases and to invite them to a semi-structured interview based on their availability and their interest. Um, in the end, uh, we were able to uh, have a good mix of uh, European member states participating, um, fewer EFTA countries and neighboring countries, um, but for sure also very good mix of uh, different impact areas. So we have five economic, seven governmental, 10 social, and eight environmental examples of reuse cases. Um, and as regards the further criteria that I've just mentioned, so for instance, having won an award or participating in a competition, it wasn't always possible to meet all uh, these three criteria, but I would say that at least 25 of the reuse cases um, participating do relate to one or more of these uh, further criteria. Um, what is the timeline of the use case observatory? As said at the beginning, um, this is the first of a series of three webinars because uh, the observatory will go until 2025 and until then we plan to publish three reports and for each of these reports we plan to have a dedicated webinar. Uh, the first report I will uh, specify uh, shortly, but um, it will be published officially in mid-October. Yet, um, I sent you this morning also uh, an email with already the link to a draft report, a draft version of the report. I will make sure also to um, send again the link here in the chat. Um, whereas the report two and three, as you can see on the slide, will be published in 2024 and 2025 and they will focus more on the changes uh, throughout the years, whereas the first report um, is more about introducing the 30 reuse cases and uh, describing the current impact they have. Um, to be uh, more specific, um, the reuse case um, observatory volume one, so the first report uh, um, has 
a first part um, related to the methodology that I just explained and the introduction to the research project. Um, after that, the main part, the main body is uh, introducing the 30 reuse cases and clustering them um, along the four impact dimensions. So here you can see in this nice image uh, all the 30 reuse cases according to these impact areas. Within the different impact areas, each of the reuse case has a dedicated two pages uh, where we try to summarize uh, key information um, regarding the reuse case. And then um, we uh, try to have three main paragraphs, one uh, related to uh, what is the reuse case about, what is the services they are offering, another uh, focusing on um, the type of open data that is used and the sources they are leveraging, and finally um, a paragraph about the impact they have, both from uh, a qualitative perspective and um, a quantitative perspective. So both uh, considering, for instance, the feedback that reuse cases has been collecting at events or the collaborations that was able to foster, um, as well as uh, more um, practical KPIs, so a number of clients, uh, visitors, users of uh, the platform or the website. In this paragraph, we also um, reported the ambitions of the different reuse cases um, for the future, and we would like then in report two and three to check again upon these ambitions to see how they changed and or um, have been met. Finally, um, the report also offers some um, lessons learned and general findings, which I have summarized in this slide. Um, from the first report, it is clear that uh, there are there is a myriad of ways in which open data reuse cases can have an impact. And you will see how um, what I mean in a uh, uh, in few minutes when I will give the floor to our speakers. At the same time, however, estimating the impact of these reuse cases is still very complex for different reasons. For many of the reuse cases, um, it remains unclear how to precisely measure the gains of their services, the impact of their services, as this requires often um, quite an extensive research. So we would say there is few data available to really track uh, this impact. And many of the reuse cases rely mostly on um, statistics and uh, web statistics for tracking their impact which as we know is only one part of the of a bigger picture uh, moreover um, another challenge is uh, the fact that not all information can be easily shared by uh, uh, reuse cases uh, for example an SME would not be so keen on sharing information on uh, revenue or number of clients for fearing uh, competition and that competitors could use this information at their advantage. Finally, we also saw how the impact trajectory and whether or not the ambitions of the last paragraph will be met um, strongly depends for all of the reuse cases on uh, financial resources and on whether they will get uh, funding, also EU funding maybe, to scale up their solution. So some of the reuse cases um, would even struggle, uh, if not, to keep forward. Um, this is because we have interviewed different kinds of entities from private uh, SMEs, startups, foundations. In a nutshell, uh, open data is uh, key for these reuse cases. In fact, uh, most of them only rely on open data. Yet the full benefit of open data uh, seems still to be unlocked to allow uh, these reuse cases to have a clear and a measurable impact on our economy, government, society and environment. But uh, I would say let's hear more um, on that from our speakers. So as said at the beginning, uh, for today we have uh, four speakers uh, which represent four of our 30 reuse cases. You, you can see that uh, on the slide we have um, Open Police, Integrate, ANP and Open Food Facts. I will introduce each of the speakers along the way. So first speaker for today is uh, Guglielmo Celata, Founder, Vice President and Technological Officer at Open Police, uh, an Italian foundation that gathers, analyzes and uses open data for various projects that explain the socioeconomic and political dynamics in Italy. Guglielmo, thank you very much for being here. 
Um, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. So hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Guglielmo Celata. Um, I'm, yeah, the founder of uh, Open Poly, one of the founders of Open Poly, which started actually as a small uh, association back in 2006. So we had almost 16 years of activity behind. We launched officially the foundation in 2018, giving a structure to this uh, enterprise. We are based in Rome, Italy, and there are almost 15 people working full time uh, uh, on a variety of projects. The next slide, uh, Julia, please. Uh, basically, what we believe in is that the data is uh, paramount, is important, uh, and, and it needs to be used for the greater good. It means it is a mean to increase people's awareness and participation in uh, both democratic process and decisions. And we do that by public uh, gathering public available data, uh, which are not always open, as we will see in the following slides, and essentially creating web applications, both web applications, and uh, providing open data for use, and also narrating this data through a, a, a data journalism section and the method, which are our main projects. These are a list of our main projects. I will not uh, go into details about them, there are the domains, but essentially we, um, in, we organize and provide insights into activities of the parliament or the municipal budget or of towns and uh, all the activities of the institu institutions and uh, administrations. We do that both by publishing web applications, as I was saying, and through an online magazine, uh, which is called www.openpolis.it, and it's the place where we do narrate the data, uh, where we give insights and analysis out of the open data that we gather uh, through articles. Uh, in simplifying terms, we have also a numbers section gathering all the data visualizations and a glossary explaining uh, in simple plain terms some of the complex components, words, processes of Italian uh, political and administrative institutions and processes. Um, we do have an impact um, because we contribute to the publications of the public institutions data in Italy. Uh, and also we give insights on them. So we think we, uh, during the course of these 16 years, we've had an impact on the state of open data in Italy. Um, and we also reach an increasing number of users through different uh, mediums, uh, both our magazines and our newsletters, which has more than 80,000 80, subscribers. And also so we have a growing base of social uh, channels, followers and uh, users. <clears throat> This is very expensive, so we have a mixed business model, uh, which includes founders and patrons giving uh, money, uh, partnership on national and international grants. Uh, we offer also commercial services, and we have a diffused uh, membership program, so individuals can make uh, donations and become member of the foundation. <clears throat> So let's focus on the two use cases, which, uh, which is actually a focus on something that can go wrong while using open data and how to get around that. The first project is a project which uh, allows people to monitor what goes on on the National Recovery Plan in Italy. Um, basically, the questions that we want to answer uh, are on how well the plan scheduling is faring. So uh, is the plan on track? as the government says it's on track, which are the measures uh, that are behind scheduling the most, uh, which organizations are responsible for the measures, the investments or the reforms. Uh, I have to say, if you don't know how uh, the uh, recovery plan works internally, it's subdivided into measures, which are reforms and investments and projects. Projects implement the measures that are decided at first level. So we are now at a situation in which we have the measures, so the structure of the recovery plan, but we still do not have the project, so the implementing activities. Um, but the question, can you go to the next slide, please, Julie?
No, I can't see. So the you know, not feedback. Can you can you see the slides? Yeah. No, I, I'm seeing the just the slide. Yeah, okay, that's the slide. So the the questions uh, that the <coughs> project tries to answer is also which companies will implement these projects and. It allows also the single user that uh, log in to the system uh, to know what goes on in its own, in his own town uh, or region, and uh, also what goes on regarding the issue. So the energy, the climate change, or the issue of the user may be interested. So it, it's a monitoring application. Uh, next slide. W what is the data source? What, what are the data sources that we use? Uh, there's an official application, uh, which is called Regis, which is used internally from the Minister of Finance, which is the office in the public administration um, managing the data produced by all the stakeholders in the National Recovery Plan. This application produces data which are officially published in the open data section of the official website, which is italiadomani.gov.it. Um, the data published up to now only regards the macro activities, so the measures and the targets, the, the schedule, but not the micro activities. The micro activities are the projects. Those data are still not available. And which kind of issues uh, did we have while uh, uh, building the web application? Well, the, the, the open data initially released were missing the metadata, so they were missing the explanation of the content. There was, there was a table couple of tables, but the tables were explained, the columns were not explained. Uh, and also there were incongruent data from a logical standpoint. Some of the identifiers uh, of the uh, measures were different from the officially document published by the government. So you couldn't identify in the open data, uh, the data, the, the, the bills and the measures, uh, which were referred in official documents. So we acted through a Freedom of Information Act request and we forced the publication of correct data. And we received a positive response from the minister in a few weeks. Um, we are now at a level in which the data about micro details, so the projects that the National Recovery Plan should do, so schools, roads, infrastructures, and also <coughs> all the sort of things those data should have been already published, but they are not. They are having issues, and we are doing another Freedom of Information Act request in order to uh, force somehow the administration to publish this data. And uh, this would allow us to go on with, uh, uh, with the web application. The second use case is Change with Italia, which is about the hosting structures for migrants coming into Italy. And they're journeying through these structures from the first hosting structure to the long term hosting structures. Um, so, the questions this project tries to answer is which structures and what type of structures are there? Where are they located in which territories, by province or town, uh, how they are clustered, and how many people a single structure can host, uh, and how, they, how much do they really host? And uh, things also about the cost. How much does a person cost per day on average? Uh, who is managing the structure and by which contracts? The data source here was only an official uh, report by the Ministry of Interior, which was published in uh, PDF. So it was a closed format. And the data were also aggregated by province. So there was no detail about the uh, single structures or um, yeah, single cities. We requested data to all of the prefectures with the office uh, handling these uh, structures, uh, and we received there are a hundred of these kind of, of prefectures in Italy, and we received alternated results. So some of them responded, and some not. And the data about contracts have been fetched from uh, the anti corruption authority. So we have money data from the anti corruption authority, which has uh, very clear and very well formed data set. What kind of issues did we have with this uh, data? The, the, the problem here is that we do we did a Freedom of Information Act request to the Ministry of Interior, 
and as a tradition by the ministry, we received a negative response. So we appealed to uh, the administrative court or tribunal, and uh, they gave us. Sorry. And we received a negative response from the ministry, and we received a positive response from the uh, administrative tribunal. Uh, so we received the data, and we were able to build the web app. We are now doing another round with the updates of the data about 2021. Uh, we received the file from the ministry, the data, but uh, those files appear to be incomplete. So we are in the loop asking them to, to give us the complete data. So that's just, uh, just to conclude, it's just um, uh, a way to tell that when you work with open data, sometimes you have to fight expensive and time consuming battles with uh, the administration getting uh, to court sometime to get the data and transparency somehow has to be enforced. But having the law, the Freedom of Information Act uh, has, has been a great help, and um, although it's an expensive one. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Guillermo. Thank you very much. Um, I already see some questions coming in. Um, so yes, let's uh, dive into our second reuse case and our second speaker of today, um, Clara Bracklo, um, CEO at um, Integrate, a German um, NGO uh, which develop a digital platform providing relevant information in several languages at the municipal level for um, newly arrived migrants and refugees uh, in Germany. Clara, thank you very much for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julia. Yes, my name is Clara Bracklo and I'm very happy to be introducing our digital integration platform Integrate here today as one of the use cases. Um, our aim is to help municipalities and other integration actors to communicate with migrants and refugees on a local level. And in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to show you how we approach this huge task and the role open data is playing in our work. Can you switch to the next slide, please? The story of our initiative began in 2015 when around 1 million refugees arrived in Germany and integration structures such as counseling centers and volunteer groups were challenged by the amount of new arrivals. One aspect that very soon became obvious was that while integration structures were in place and while being very challenged, they were ready to provide the support needed. Information about where to go and who to ask and what exactly to ask for could hardly be found online and let alone in the mother tongue of those arriving. During this time, some of Integrate's founders were assisting refugees in the south of Germany in Augsburg um, and as the lack of information became more and more obvious, um, they had the idea to build a digital multilingual platform where all relevant local information could be found. In a joint effort of the integration association Tür an Tür in Augsburg and the Technical University in Munich and the social department of the city of Augsburg, Integrate was launched in, with local content in Augsburg in November 2015. This platform at the time contained not only important addresses, but also basic information about all topics relevant to the integration process in order to provide users with an overview and knowledge that would save precious time in counseling sessions, as those could be more focused on really individual problems. At this point in 2015, there was no actual plan to expand Integrate much further. However, as the solution was developed to be the most sustainable it could be, uh, use cases beyond the city of Augsburg were already considered from the get-go. And of course, the whole source code was developed open source. After the introduction of Integrate um, in Augsburg, other municipalities very quickly addressed our team as they were facing very, very similar challenges as Augsburg did. And the, those challenges were that while a lot of help was being offered all over Germany, and a lot of knowledge was in the heads and of integration experts and even volunteers. Um, most municipalities in Germany were struggling a lot to provide this information digital and in multiple languages. And while topics um, that are relevant and user groups have evolved over time, Integrate was able to adapt 
accordingly due to its very open concept, which I will show you a little bit more further. Currently, we have around 90 municipalities all ac uh, across Germany using Integrate actively. Can you change to the next slide, please? One of the reasons why Integrate has been so sustainable is that the needs and the circumstances of the users are very well matched with the solution, which can also adapt very easily to changes and ch new challenges. Looking at the situation that migrants and refugees are confronted with when arriving in Germany, three aspects I would like to mention. First of all, most migrants and refugees, just as anybody else, um, have access to smartphones and they use them for information and contact to family and friends. Providing information for them through this established channel um, via an app therefore presents as itself as a very good and um, easy to use option for them. However, um, a stable internet connection in Germany is not always a given, uh, especially in rural areas, and therefore information needs to be available offline as well, which is also something we can um, ensure do through an app. The third aspect is that topics um, related to integration have a very high dynamic and contact information regulations and offers change on a very regular basis. So the solution we have come up with is Integrate, which offers all relevant information on a local level so that the authorities and the counselors can focus on the important 101 advice, as there are so many topics that we know cannot be covered digitally. Um, and we know we can always only support um, those personal counseling sessions by providing any information that is relevant to a larger group of people. Can you switch to the next slide, please? For our solution, um, open data works as a great catalyst, catalyst, I always pronounce that wrong, for information transparency. While local integration experts write and administer all information for their respective region, our team can focus on the technical side of things. All information is published under a Creative Commons license, and therefore all information accumulates in a big pool of information. This means that a new municipality doesn't have to start on a blank slate, but can build on what already is there and has been done by others before. And even established municipalities such as Augsburg from the very, very beginning um, can benefit from the existing pool of information when adding new chapters, adding new topics or even translations. For many municipalities, Integrate is one of the first occasions they encounter not only the concept of open data, but at the same time and more importantly, the many benefits of it. By actively working with and creating open data and integration context through Integrate, an important seed for advocating the benefits of open data is, seated, is planted within the municipality. With Integrate, we are very conscious of making all information published as accessible as possible. Therefore, once information is published within Integrate, it is also searchable through our common search engines. Um, within Integrate, we are also building bridges to other available information offers, for example, different interfaces to job platforms. Integrate is an example of how through open source of the code on one hand and open data of all information, sustainability and transparency can be ensured beyond singular organizations involved and therefore the impact can be higher and way more sustainable in the long run. Our main goal with Integrate is to reduce the information poverty as it is one of the main contributing factors when limiting people's opportunities and chances in society. And in our interview with Julia, which she mentioned in the beginning, um, she asked us whether or not what we are doing would be possible or even working out without open data. And our hard answer would be no, because um, if we're working on inf information transparency, um, and that's being all our main goal, um, the usage and promotion of open data is a non-brainer and a really crucial part of working towards a more accessible and more understandable system for everybody. Can you switch to the next slide, please? <laughs> As an organization, we do our best to assist the integration experts on site in their task of providing user adequate local information. And while Integrate creates a shared communication space between all actors involved in the integration process on the local level, so for example, volunteers, migrants themselves, um, integration facilities, we also create regular exchange between the municipalities working with Integrate 
to strengthen knowledge exchange between them and um, create a bigger network. We have seen in the previous years that this combination of a local focus and the bigger picture enables municipalities to react to big challenges such as the COVID pandemic or the war in Ukraine much faster as they can join forces early on and um, learn how to create information and use information together. Can you switch to the next slide, please? To end my presentation, I would like to take a little bit of a look into the future of Integrate and to give you an idea what is next for us. As a social enterprise, we focus obviously on the impact and we can have on the lives of migrants and refugees. And measuring this impact is a big task and a very important one as well. So we are currently conducting a randomized control trial with around 500 active participants as for now all over Germany to learn more about the impact of Integrate um, as an um, enabler of access to the society. Furthermore, we are working hard on reducing the translation costs as those make up of the highest amount next to personal and when implementing Integrate to enable more municipalities to join and provide information on, on a local level. And we also hope to strengthen links to municipal website and to ease the search of in, for information within Integrate even further through possibly implementing a chatbot that can answer questions on a more personal level. And lastly, we believe we have learned very early on that uh, we can scale our impact beyond Augsburg, um, but we believe that that is not the end of it and um, that information poverty due to language barriers is limiting migrants and refugees access all over the world and we are very interested to see how we can still scale the impact even beyond the borders of Germany. Yes, and I'm very happy to answer your questions in the chat and my colleague is here as well and um, yeah, I'm happy to also be in contact afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clara. Um, that's really interesting. Um, yes, so going forward, um we have now our third speaker um Jelle Kamsma head of product at ANP in the Netherlands where they developed the local focus platform providing journalists with selection of interesting open data sets easy data visualization tools and analysis that can be used uh, in articles Jelle thank you very much for being here um I will give you now the floor and also please feel free to share your slides as yeah. said do you see my slides by now? Yes, I okay. see that. <laughs> That's great. Okay, yeah, uh, good to be here and thanks for uh, for having me. Um, so a little bit uh, about the situation we saw 10 years ago. Uh, that was that uh, a lot of people, basically everybody in journalism was talking about data journalism, but the big problem was that few were actually doing it. So you could go to any journalism congress and people would um, uh, tell about the benefits of doing more with data. But when we were looking at uh, the Dutch uh, media landscape, uh, only few newsrooms were actually hiring data journalists. And that's a pity because um, it can prove to be tremendously valuable for especially uh, local and regional newsrooms. Uh, and one of the problems was that uh, uh, data journalism was thought of as, as expensive as labor intensive and that it was really hard to find the right people um, and we thought that we were able to come up with a solution for that. So this is how we started 10 years ago with three founders, all three news nerds, all three people that uh, had a journalistic background and uh, the solution we saw is to set up a data driven news service aimed towards smaller regional newsrooms. And we thought, well, if we take away all those technical hurdles, uh, we collect the data, we analyze the data, and we present the data in such a format uh, that uh, any journalist is able to use it and is able to use it to tell stories, then that could, uh, could be greatly beneficial for, uh, for the news landscape in, uh, in the Netherlands. So 10 years ago, we were still an independent company with uh, just six people. Um, but by the end of last year, we were acquired by AMP, uh, which is the Dutch uh, press agency. Um, but we're still basically doing the same stuff now, just within a larger organization. So two things that we uh, that we did, but that we still do. Uh, first of all, we have a news service, and this is basically a daily feed of graphics and data sets 
that can be easily customized by our clients with our uh, news publications. Uh, and sometimes these are graphics that go along with the existing news. So for example, if AMP publishes uh, uh, a news article on the inflation numbers, we provide the data and the graphics with it. Um, but also, and this is something we do like five to 10 times a day, um, but we also do larger investigations into data sets. And this is especially interesting with regional data because then uh, our clients can also zoom in to their own region and make their own story with it. Uh, and then we collect the data, we analyze the data, and we also try to explain uh, to, our, uh, to, to the journalists that use us uh, why uh, this data is newsworthy and what questions can be asked uh, with the data. Um, but to do this, we uh, uh, really needed a platform. So uh, we immediately thought that if we would just share the, the data sets as CSV files or as Excel files or whatever, then hardly any journalist would, uh, would be able to use it. So we built a data platform that immediately visualizes the data, uh, makes maps and charts with it. Um, and then that allows us to distribute those visual representations of the data with, our, uh, with, with the newsrooms. So to give you a quick overview how this might work, uh, this is our news feed in the AMP app. This is, for example, a graphic on the situation in uh, Ukraine. Um, but people can just uh, quickly select uh, the story and the data set that is relevant to them, then go onto our platform, uh, but still have the possibility to customize the data. So they can make selections in it to see uh, what fits their story best. Uh, the branding of the publication is immediately applied to the graphic. So they don't have to care about uh, the design. This has all been implemented for them. And of course, everything has to be responsive because it has to work on all platforms. Uh, and then with just one click, they can uh, publish the graphic and uh, embed it in their own article. Um, so this shows you how fast that can go. And that also makes sure that uh, uh, um, yeah, a lot of Dutch news media outlets are using us. Uh, so I would say almost all, uh, that's not entirely the case, but I think around 90% of all Dutch news publications uh, are using this system to enrich their uh, storytelling with, uh, with data, which I think is uh, tremendously important. Um, and if you look at uh, the impact we have, um, our maps and charts uh, uh, at the moment, uh, this can fluctuate a lot, but, but are uh, looked at between 50 and 100 million times a month. Um, and these are both the charts and maps that we make, but also uh, maps and charts that they, uh, the media themselves make with our platform. Um, and these numbers are uh, from, uh, from today, but you can imagine when the corona crisis started, these numbers were uh, like, like two to three times higher even. So we had to tackle a couple of challenges, which I think might be interesting uh, to, uh, to you all. Uh, and one of the first one was uh, to really democratize data journalism and visualization. So if you would look at, at other services uh, and other data visualization platforms, they were always focused more towards uh, like the experts, like the people that really enjoy um, playing around with spreadsheets. And um, that's also somebody who I am. Uh, I, I love to, to, to play around with, uh, with data, but if you want to be, make sure that every journalist can use it, you really need to come up with a platform that is really easy to use and that they can uh, make these graphic within minutes because journalists are always working with a deadline. Uh, and this is something I'm really proud of. If I look at uh, Algemeen Dagblad, the newspaper you just saw in the little video, then we see that, that between 60 and 80 journalists each month log into our platform and, and uh, utilize the data that we provide them with. So this is something that uh, uh, really shows that this is not something that is done by a few, but really by all editors in the newsroom. Uh, part of this is also to, to provide a continuous feed of awesome and newsworthy data-driven reporting. So we don't do a reporting a month or a week, but we try to come up with something every day. So they always know that we're the place to look for if they want to uh, find the latest and most relevant data. Uh, so a couple uh, examples on that, uh, and we get the data from all different sources. So this is uh, a, a map with uh, fines that were being uh, given out for violations on the water. Uh, eight years ago, we had to acquire this data by a freedom of information request. But at the moment, the government body that is uh, responsible for these data sets publishes these data on their website. So this also shows that a lot has uh, changed in the last uh, 10 years and also something that makes our work a lot more 
uh, enjoyable and easy. Um, and like I said, we are not local focus calls for nothing. Uh, we always focused on uh, making sure the data could be used by uh, regional and local outlets. And one of the things that is tremendously important, we are a press agency, so we work one for many, uh, but we also want to give our clients the possibility to zoom into the data and to tell the stories that are relevant to their direct environment. So our software enables journalists to really easily compare municipalities or different postal codes, uh, zoom into their region, uh, show differences, show patterns, show outliers, and base their story on, on that and to tell something that is relevant to their uh, readers. Um, and same is also um, for, for journalists, it's important to, to have everything in their own branding. So this is something that can be really easily applied on all the graphics. Uh, and this might sound like a small thing, but if you want journalists to use your graphics, it's really important for them to uh, make sure that it fits within their website. Uh, and the same also goes for print and, and web. Uh, we always have been a web-based uh, tool uh, and our focus has always been on the internet, but uh, many of our clients are uh, newspapers. And although they are working online first more and more, uh, they still have newspaper to fill. And it wouldn't make a lot of sense for them to make the same graph twice. So uh, we also implement the workflow that enables our clients to, to uh, export the data as an iframe code for publication on the website, but also as a PDF in vector format for publication in the newspaper. So this, uh, this is also part of what makes uh, the tool easy to use for them. Um, and this is something that really um, got us thinking when Corona happened. We were doing a lot by hand and there was a lot to say for that because we really were looking deep into the data uh, and really were able to, to, to present the data and to filter the data in such a way that it was useful for journalists. But when uh, Corona happened, we noticed that uh, we couldn't keep up with the work anymore. Uh, we had to make uh, dozens of graphs a day uh, on a daily basis because the, day, the, the numbers were constantly shifting. So this um, pushed us towards making more automated connections to, to open data sources uh, from the Dutch uh, health ministry to make sure that all these uh, graphics and maps are updated automatically whenever new data is, uh, is available. So I'm talking a lot about uh, the software that we've made, but I think maybe the most important thing is, is that we're also really approachable to, to Dutch news media. Um, so this took some time, but uh, we did become somewhat of an authority on, on data journalism and uh, uh, journalists always can call us to spar on which conclusions they can derive from a certain data set, what pitfalls should they look out for. Um, data is always about definitions and, and this is something we can help them with and uh, this also makes them more confident that the conclusions they derive from the data sets we provide them with are correct. Uh, and they're not, um, yeah, so, so they're, they're, they're factual in their reporting. Uh, so um, that's something they can always call us for. So this is something we're working on at the moment uh, and, and something that is really exciting to me. We always been focused really on the Dutch media landscape, um, but since we became part of AMP, we've often been talking with more uh, international uh, news agencies. Um, so now we're looking uh, whether this model could also work for uh, countries abroad and uh, two countries are going to take up this model, uh, Belgium with the Belgian press agency and Canada with Canadian press uh, to see if this model can also work for their media markets. Uh, and part of that uh, might also be uh, to try to apply this system to European data sets because uh, uh, like, just like you can zoom into a region in, in Holland, uh, you can imagine that European data sets can also provide many different stories for European news outlets. So these are challenges that we're still uh, trying to take on at the moment, but uh, this is something we're really excited about. So, uh, well, thanks for, uh, for your, your attention. Thank you very much, Jelle. Um, it was also very interesting to hear from you. Um, we will have now our um, fourth uh, and last speakers, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Stéphane Gigandet, um, uh, from um, founder of the French Open Food Facts, uh, which offers a large database of food products, creating easy to understand information about nutritional value and an environmental impact of food. Stéphane, uh, thank you for being here. 
the floor is yours and also the screen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK, perfect. So I'm Stefan, and I'm the founder of Open Food Facts. And let me dive uh, right, right into the problem that we are trying to address, which is the uh, impact that food has on our health, uh, the environment, and society. So we, we, all, we all eat uh, multiple times a day, but as you know, it has a huge impact on, uh, on the health. Uh, for the five last decades, uh, obesity rates have been steadily climbing. Um, food is also, the food industry is also a huge uh, part of the, of the carbon that uh, goes into the atmosphere. But the good news, the very good news is that by now everyone is aware of that and a lot of people are very willing to act uh, to change this. Uh, the challenge now that, that we are trying to face is uh, how do we transform that willingness to do things into uh, action and hopefully uh, impact. And let me give you an example of uh, what I mean by willingness. So if, I, if you want to, to buy uh, the best uh, cereals, for instance, uh, for your kids, for yourself, uh, the most healthiest ones, ones with the least uh, uh, impact on the environment, it's, it's actually very difficult because you're in stores like this and which, what do you do? You, you can uh, look at all uh, packages and try to look at nutrition fact numbers. There's actually a lot of data on those uh, packages, but it's very, very difficult to actually compare products and find the, the best one. So what do we do? And that's, uh, that's a question that we asked ourselves uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and by, uh, but when I mean we, I mean we as a citizen, consumers, uh, we are thinking that food is so important that uh, it's not only uh, the responsibility of the food industry or the, or the governments or Europe to, uh, to try to find solutions. We try to ask ourselves, what can we do as citizens to, uh, to, to find solutions? So we, we created a kind of movement, a community to, uh, to tackle this problem. And, and the first thing that we, that we did is we, we, really much, we very much believe that to, to, uh, to solve those problems, we need all the data about, about those problems to, to be free. So we created what we call a, a digital uh, public good a big database of all the data that we can find about food and food products. And then we try to build tools so that this data can be uh, transformed into actionable uh, knowledge that people can act uh, about. Um, so what we started with is to create this huge database of food products. It's like a Wikipedia of food products. And it started small, but uh, we started 10 years ago, and now we have more than 2.5 million products from uh, basically all over the world. Um, and what's interesting is that we started with uh, crowdsourcing. So people like you and I scanning uh, barcodes, taking pictures of products, et cetera. But then now more and more producers are willingly giving us data about uh, their products. And so some, an, an industry that was very secret is now giving us uh, data and transparency is becoming the, the dawn. And I, I think that's, that's very interesting uh, about uh, open data. And then the next thing that we then do is to, we try to get this, all this raw data about food and enrich it, so to give it meaning, to, uh, to, make, to make it more useful. So that, that's, I'm showing you, for instance, some slides of our new mobile application, where from raw data about ingredients and nutrition, we can compute scores like the Nutri-Score, the Eco-Score, we can tell you if this product fits your diet or not, and you can use that to decide uh, which product uh, to buy. But this is not only about consumers. It's also about uh, food manufacturers. Using all these data, they can actually improve their products. Um, we created a, 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 a platform for food producers. They can upload all their, all their data to publish it as open data. But we also analyze the data to tell them, oh, out of your uh, 2,000 products, 400 of them, you could get a, a better Nutri-Score by just slightly reducing, for instance, salt or sugar or fat. And what's interesting is that uh, they actually do it. Uh, and that's great because it improves the food supply for everyone, not just uh, consumers who are the most uh, aware of the problem. Uh, just a bit about history. So we started 10 years ago. And just one thing I wanted to mention is that for the first eight years, we were all uh, volunteers. Uh, and now, now we have a nonprofit with employees. 
at the very start, we were, we were all volunteers for, for eight years. Um, so how do we create and use open data? Uh, so we have this huge uh, uh, Wikipedia of food database that we create from so crowdsourcing the industry. We also use a lot of machine learning to get uh, data from uh, pictures. So all the label logos to uh, OCR to get uh, ingredient list, etc. And as I said, we so collecting all this data is already a huge amount of work because uh, actually uh, producers, you would think that big companies have, uh, have all this data available and that just, uh, just have to click on a button to send it. But the truth is they have a huge amount of quality problems, et cetera. So it's already a huge amount of work to actually collect this data. And on top of that, there's a huge amount of work that we do to enrich the data. So for instance, we have those lists in, of ingredients in all languages and we have we created algorithms and taxonomies to really identify each single ingredient so that we can tell you, for instance, if this product is vegan, vegetarian, so that, so that we can link the data to a life cycle analysis database to, to get the environmental impact and, and all that. So that's a huge amount of work. And the reason why I point this is a huge amount of work, it's, it makes a lot of sense to mutualize that work, to do it once, that everybody works on it and then we publish all this as open data and everybody can uh, can benefit this and so that that's what we did from the very start and now this data is has been reused in more than 200 applications almost all uh, food applications uh, in in europe uh, are, are reusing uh, our data and it's also used uh, by uh, by scientists uh, to to make research um we not only produce open data we use open data as well so we use um, uh, for instance, uh, reports from food additives from the French, uh, from, from the European Food Safety Agency. Uh, we use list of food establishments so that we can see which factory produce uh, which uh, product. And that's very interesting when there is a food recall, for instance. Uh, we use nutrition database. We use this the new Agribalis database from the French um, Environmental Health Agency. It's a life cycle analysis database, and that's what allows us to compute uh, what, what we call eco scores uh, for, all, for all food products. And we use a uh, wiki data as well. Um, one word about our impact with all this data because well, that's the very reason for, for the project. Um, what I find very, very interesting about open data is this potential for what we call systemic impact. So we have this direct impact on consumers through our website or mobile application. And so that's more than 2 million users uh, every month. Indirectly, we also have impact on uh, all those apps that, that are powered by our API, by our data. And more systematically, more massively, we, we supported the launch of the Nutri-Score, which is now printed on uh, most products in France. And it's starting to get into uh, many more European countries. Um, there's this global improvement of uh, the quality of products that I talked about and, and, the, and the research work. Um, one illustration of, a very good illustration of that is, is the Nutri-Score. Uh, about uh, seven years ago, we, we contacted the scientists who created the Nutri-Score. We asked for the formula. We computed the Nutri-Score for all products in the database. Now those scientists that we use our data to validate the scores, um, food producers are improving the nutri scores and, and it's, it's now spreading uh, across Europe. So that's, that's really a, a, a great testimony to the power of, of open data. Um, and starting one year ago, we, had, we, we copy the success of the nutri score to the environmental impact. And that's uh, what we call the, the eco score. It, again, it started in France, but uh, this picture of the supermarket, it's actually in Lidl in uh, Germany. And Colrut in Belgium has also uh, adopted the, the eco score. Um, yeah, that's, as I said, the power of open data. You publish open data, reuses happen, and then it gets more interesting. You get more contributors, more data. So we just have to create this, uh, uh, this uh, get the, go to the tipping point uh, and so, so, so that this uh, virtuous circle happen. Um, and now, of course, we how do you how do we replicate that all over the, the world? That's that's where you can help. I hope. Uh, Open Food Facts. It's a, a, a non-profit uh, organization. We don't sell anyone to, anything to anyone. 
Um, we now have a, have a team of uh, eight full-time employees. Our current partners are mostly French, so the French health agency, the French environment agency. We are also funded by Europe through the NGI and the Net Foundation, and uh, and we have uh, we won the Google Impact Challenge for climate. Um, so I looked and I was very happy to see that we have 80 people in uh, attending the, this talk. So I really much that we we can discuss with some of you to see how we could work together to try to replicate uh, this impact all across Europe in your country. Um, we would be very interested in particular to how to get in touch with the uh, end users, with your local national health agencies and environmental agencies, how to contact producers, manufacturers from your country so that we can help them open their data and improve their products. Uh, so we are looking for partners all over Europe. So please to, uh, don't hesitate to, to talk to us. We, we'll be, we would be very happy to send you the slides and have another presentation with you uh, uh, very soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. It was uh, very, very interesting. And um, in connection to this latter point, so uh, uh, getting in touch with you and in general with our speakers, uh, um, I think this will also be uh, very possible because of uh, um, the report. Uh, um, as you can see already in the draft report, um, in our annex, we have a list of all the use cases that have participated in uh, um, the um, use case observatory with their contact email. So that would also facilitate probably um, getting in touch with them. Um, yes, so. Are, we are now at the moment of Q&A. Uh, I saw that some questions have already um, arrived in the chat. Some have been answered, but maybe we can start with the uh, with the last uh, one, uh, which uh, is from Giuseppe, uh, who is asking to uh, Yelle, with respect to measuring uh, the impact of your work, how do you measure um, how many visualization your work receives? Um, news outlets views where your visualization is present, for example. Yeah. Um, so we get uh, daily reports on, on where our visuals are being published. So uh, our visuals are basically like little web pages. Um, so we can exactly see where they are being published and also uh, how many times they are viewed and clicked on. Uh, so we don't use any trackers or cookies or anything uh, that collects personal data. But we have a pretty good view on, on uh, what visuals are uh, being viewed at and which uh, subjects when it comes to data are popular. So this is something that helps us as our editorial staff uh, to, to give focus on, on what, uh, what data sets uh, are, are um, uh, popular, but also uh, is something that is really helpful to our clients so they can see what is the impact of uh, uh, providing data with your stories and and uh, are people really uh, looking forward to that so um, uh, this is something we uh, automated the recording with um okay uh i see also <laughs> uh um other questions related more to um yeah which kind of sources uh, you are um relying on you as uh, in general speakers um some have been answered but maybe this is a good question for uh, each of you so um i was uh, telling you that in fact uh, most of the reuse cases interviewed uh said that they couldn't exist without open data but of course, sometimes there is the need also to leverage other uh, other data. So my question and the question that I see also in the chat is um, whether uh, you supplement open data also with other sources. Um, how do you how do you uh, approach the case where you're missing some data and this data is not open or available? Um, maybe we can uh, start with um, uh, Stefan and then whoever wants to. <laughs> Um, answer. So whenever we miss uh, open data, we try to see if we could just uh, create it. And we we start from, we have a very bottom-up approach. Like for instance, right now we are trying to open, uh, we, we are trying to get data about the prices and uh, the, the transparency of the value chain. And we know it's going to be very difficult to get this data, but we also know that some producers are open to that, very few, but we can start with them and open their data and, 
and try to get a, a snowball uh, effect. Uh, right now, we are very much working on environmental impact. It's difficult to get some data about like the precise origin of ingredients for all products. Some manufacturers are still uh, a bit shy about uh, sharing that, but others are very willing to do that. So we work with those and we, we show them, okay, no, nothing terrible is going to happen if this data is open. Actually, things will be better. You will be able to, to improve. Uh, and, and that's the same also for other agencies. For instance, we worked a lot with ADEM, the French Environmental Agency, that created this AgriBalis uh, life cycle analysis database about food. And we very much push them to uh, release it as open data. And they, they had a lot of uh, resistance uh, from, uh, from stakeholders to not do that. Uh, but in the end, they, they did. And now this database, it, it's actually, I think it's the first really open database, open as in open data about life cycle analysis for food here, uh, in the world. And I'm very much hoping that it will uh, snowball as well to all the other Euro European countries because we, we need this data. We, this data needs to, to be open. It, it, we, it's, it's like for, for COVID, for instance, when all the data is shared by uh, scientists, then we make progress much, much faster. We get vaccines and all that. So. I strongly hope that we collectively, we can all always make the case for uh, open data. Anyone else who wants to um, also answer to this question? Um, so in, in my case, we utilized uh, like many techniques to, to get data if it wasn't publicly available yet. Uh, as I said in my presentation, we uh, in the past, we had to rely more on FOI requests Freedom of Information Act request uh, to, to really compel uh, Dutch governmental organizations to share the data with us. Um, but we're seeing more and more that, that these organizations are publishing the data uh, as open data. Uh, so that, that is a good, uh, good thing to see. Uh, but we also relied on crowdsourcing in certain instances. So we did uh, investigations into unsafe traffic uh, situations. Uh, and this was something, there was some data available on traffic deaths in, in the Netherlands or uh, some, some related data, but uh, we really wanted to, to hear what the, the people in the neighborhoods were thinking. Uh, and for that, we built a crowdsource tool so they could pinpoint where they uh, thought there were unsafe situations. So this is also something that uh, afterwards was widely used also by the municipalities and the government agencies that were responsible for those situations to get more insight in, in how they could uh, do, do a better job. So uh, that's also a way to, to uh, yeah, get data if it's not available yet. Yeah. yeah. I think also Guillermo worked a lot with the Freedom of Information Act, right? Um, you were saying. Yeah, I agree with you. Sometimes you just need to ask the data. Uh, with a stronger perspective, so with a stronger initiative. And the Freedom of Information Act is legally what somehow compelled the institutions to comply. Uh, and sometimes it works. Sometimes the problem is that they don't have the data because the data uh, are not yet ready. For example, today, uh, the, Minister of Interior, the Minister of Finance has revealed that the data about projects in the National Recovery Plan uh, is starting to be um, published, but they are having issues. And the issues are always technical or administ administrative issues. So it's a, it's a, with, with the public administration, it's a process. You have to be patient because they are uh, uh, adapting to this new policy that the data must be published. It's a change, it's a cultural shift, and, and you have to be patient because the public administration, at least in Italy, is a huge machine and it works at different uh, speeds. So, of course, you do freedom of information because that's our role. We are a civic society, so we need those data. And if the law says that those data need to be published, we have to enforce that somehow. Um, it, at the beginning of our history, we, we also relied on um, crowdsourcing some data. Um, we tend not to do that right now for the nature of the data that we are interested in, because the nature of the data are political and economical, so there is little to be crowdsourced. 
but it's it's of course it's it's a way to to gather data and we also try to get the data by machine learning uh, using uh, analyzer on web pages in order to for example get relations of power between institution and persons so that's that's another mean that we use uh, we analyze web pages uh, newspaper web pages and try to extract information on relations or who is having a relationship with somebody else or within a, uh, an organization. So we try to get those kind of data out of the web. And that's another very expensive way of uh, finding information. And, and it's also something that you have to check almost manually because uh, as you can imagine, it's very difficult that these matches are 100% uh, sure, but it's a way of doing that, yes. Also, we clean the data that we get from the open data. Much of, many times, most of the time, the data that come in an open format uh, are not clean. They have uh, uh, duplications, they are not normalized, so we have to make a, a, a huge amount of job of those data. And that somehow provides value to the data that we provide back to the public. And that's part of our commercial uh, activities. We, we take open data, we improve the open data, we clean the open data, we cross the open data with other, uh, other sources, and then we somehow are able to, to sell the job that we put into this uh, data if commercial entities are interested in this data, or we provide those data back whenever that's possible to the general public. So that's a mixed approach that also grants uh, the fact that we have to pay wages for 15 to 20 people here. I see there is a follow up question um, related to um, um, yeah, to data. Um, what could be done better in your respective national open data platforms for you to find uh, relevant open data more easily? I don't know if someone, someone in the among the speakers, um, want to try to answer this question. <laughs> maybe I can make a starting point, and maybe that even links to what we have discussed before. I think the um, there is still a lot of resistance towards opening up data, as uh, Stefane said. Uh, like there's for some reason a fear that is maybe not even clear why there is the fear to share data openly. And there's um, not, I think, enough awareness of how important transparency in information is in a in an age of information um, to everybody to open it up and to make it available in order to utilize it in different ways for different people's needs. So I think for us, um, the main point is that we oftentimes we have discussions about um, can, can we use this information? Is something available? Is it possible to use your text, your translation, your offer here? And we are doing a lot of um, explicatory work, I think. And that's completely fine. We like doing it because we also believe in the um, political change that it will bring. But I think to be more aware as a society of the many benefits of open data, and I think you're you are doing a lot of work here, um, but to spread it more widely and to talk about it and to make it more, even more known, because I don't think it is in everybody's mind what open data even means and how it can benefit us in moving forward. Anyone else who wants to add on this? Yeah, no, it's, it's basically what Clara also says. The, this this research, I think, is tremendously important and also something that could be replicated, I think, by by national uh, data portals, make the use cases visible. Uh, and, and that is also something I think will help to make policy policymakers understand why it's valuable to share the data. Because um, just as I started my presentation with the, the, the thing that People were talking about data journalism, but not actually doing it. This can also be the same case for for open data. A lot of people are talking about it, but how many people are actually using it? And uh, to 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 compel organizations to share it, for them is also valuable to see uh, what uh, what is given back in in that respect. So uh, yeah, showing the use cases is uh, I think an important step. 
Yeah, yeah um, I do agree with Jelle. And I think also that uh, being someone on the open data, working with open data since more than 15 years, uh, I can see that there is uh, some, somehow a, a change in the perception of the importance of the open data. Uh, we have been during the last part of the 2000s, so 2008 until 2012, uh, everyone is talking about opening data and how this would provide a market for the companies to jump in and make business out of it. And that didn't happen actually. So this way of opening the data uh, somehow was uh, lessened and now it's more an institutional, um, at least as, as I can perceive it, more at an institutional level. Open data means exactly what we are discussing here right now. We use opening the data to um, increase people's awareness about uh, context and uh, the possibilities of uh, association or foundations like ours, not to make business, but to create awareness. So that's a, somehow some, some sort of a um, civic impact more than a, an economic impact. And, and that's, uh, that's why this, this uh, research is very important because the impact is fundamental. It's, uh, it's, it's what can make people understand at various institutional level why opening the data is important, why this cultural shift must be taken uh, to the end, it must not be stopped. And as to why people in the government, in the institutions, uh, have difficulties in uh, uh, letting the data uh, be shared, it's just a cultural, in my opinion, it's just a cultural um, attitude. So it's uh, someone building his own career upon the silos of data that he controls. He, and I say he, not just because it's, it's a pronoun, it's common use, but it, because usually it's a male. Uh, a person my age or more, so about 55, 60, and that's, that's culturally relevant because that's the way they build, they power their relation by using the, the access to this data. And that has to change because we are in different, we're not in the 20th century, we are in the uh, information age, information must be shared, and through sharing information, uh, something new, must happen also at a, at a civic level. That's, that's, uh, I think that's very important. Okay, um, thank you, Guglielmo. Um, I think we have still uh, 10 minutes, so I would like to finish the round of questions uh, five uh, minutes before ending the webinar, so maybe we can have just one uh, more question. Um, and I see uh, there is a question um, regarding how you speakers uh, deal with data in different languages. Um, for example, does local focus only work in Dutch and English? Um, or what about food information and products that are specific to a local European market? Uh, I think this is uh, more for uh, Stefan and Open Food Facts. So, uh, Jelle, Stefan. Yeah. So well, this this now is something that becomes really relevant for us because we start working in Belgium, and now of course everything has to be uh, bilingual, so both in Dutch and in French. Um, so we're now thinking up of smart ways to automate the translation, so that uh, these visuals also uh, don't have to be made twice, but all the relevant uh, from date notations can be translated quite easily into different languages. Um, so this will be bilingual, but I can imagine a case in the future where we are doing this with European data sets for a range of different European nations and different languages. And then, um, yeah, also our focus will be ease of use. And then uh, you don't want to be a, that you have to make the visualizations in 12 languages by hand. Uh, so I think there, there are smart ways to do this automatically. And this is something we're working on now for the Belgium uh, case. And I think it's a very, very, very interesting question. And that's actually why we believe it really makes sense to have one global database about food products uh, so that uh, apps and reusers don't have to go to, like, to specific database with different format in, in each uh, different country. So we have a lot of uh, 
volunteers could translate everything, who also work on the algorithms to analyze the ingredients, etc. Uh, and and the benefit of that is that with one API, with one format, now you can all of the users they build apps that can that work in uh, all over all over the world. And it's not only apps and reusers, it's also scientists. So we work very closely with the team that created the Nutri-Score. And they, they study the impact of the Nutri-Score in different countries. And thanks to our database, it's very easy for them to replicate that, that study across Europe and also in other countries like uh, Mexico, for instance. Uh, I, I really believe that if we want to tackle those huge problems, like the impact of food on the uh, environment and health, we really need to the brains of uh, everyone on the planet to be able to work on finding solution. And once they have once they have found solution, they need an easy way to deploy it all across the world. Uh, and that's really what is happening with uh, the new the Nutri-Score now. And I'm very happy about that. Um, and yeah, that's for, for th that's really that's very much the reason why I uh, I strongly feel that uh, we really makes a lot of sense for everyone to contribute to like one uh, global uh, and, and very much open food database, just like we have one Wikipedia, one open street map, et cetera. Those, those are huge, like global digital public goods and, and we need to, uh, to support them. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Uh, okay, uh, so I would uh, maybe close now the floor. I know that, um, we could go on forever with questions, and I think our speakers are also very happy to continue answering. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to them also separately um, and to us uh, on our email that is in the chat in case you have further comments. Um, regarding uh, comments and feedback, uh, um, please uh, Feel free also to provide us with uh, feedback regarding this webinar. It takes only two minutes and uh, really helps us a lot to understand where to improve. I will also uh, share the link in the chat um, just to uh, in case you cannot um, use um, uh, the QR. Uh, finally, before closing, I would like to remind you of some uh, next events uh, organized by the Publications Office. Uh, first of all, uh, the final event of uh, the EU Datadome competition. Uh, some of the speakers and some of the uh, use cases also already participated into uh, this nice open data competition that is held annually. And there will be the final event on the 20th of October. So uh, please register um, if you want to attend. I will also share the link uh shortly but anyhow you can find information on the publications office uh website as well um another uh nice uh, next webinar that we'll be organizing is a second webinar for data providers uh, understanding open data and technical openness this will be uh, on the 21st of october uh, so quite quite busy timeline for for those days um, and registration are also still open um, and you can find more information on data.europa academy. Finally, these are our contacts uh, uh, and social media if you want to uh, follow us for uh, any further events. Um, so I think I can just now uh, thank you all for participating, attending this uh, event. Thank you to our speakers uh, for, for being here and for providing their perspective on um, reuse of open data and open data impact. Um, thank you also for, uh, for to the data.europa.eu team um, who helped organize this, uh, Giuseppe, uh, David, thank you. And yeah, have a nice uh, afternoon and a nice weekend.